where have we got to? Well, on day one, Tim helped us think about, thanks Caroline, Tim helped us think about how we know what is good. Uh, yesterday, Caroline helped us think about what, what is good, what is the subject matter of the good. And today we're gonna to think about how do we promote what is good? How do we take the, 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 the biblical worldview and promote it into a secular pluralist uh, society? Uh, and in many ways, it will build on what we've already heard uh, this morning. Um, uh, I guess Sandra was helping us with techniques about how we get our message across. Uh, and what we might think about today is how, a bit more now, is how we build that message, how we work out what we want to say when we have the opportunities of, of giving interviews in the media. And at the end, uh, I hope we'll think a little bit about what is the specific role of the lawyer in promoting the good. So what's the problem? Why do Christians struggle to communicate effectively in, um, in a pluralist and secularist society? Why do those that aren't Christians fail to listen or to understand what we're saying? Well, I, I think there's many reasons, but, but one of them I think is that we don't reflect on how we should get our message across well enough. Language, arguments, tone, or timing, well, they could all be wrong. But Jesus, well, he was a master at communication, no matter what the situation was, no matter what the topic was or the audience was. So we need to think about how we go about promoting this biblical good that we were thinking about yesterday in our society. Sometimes people reflect on uh, these verses from Matthew. Blessed are you when people insult you persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I wonder if you've ever heard Christians quote that when they're maligned in the media or in public. But I think we often forget or some people often forget the very important words falsely and because of me in these verses. There is a temptation, isn't there, to rejoice when we suffer persecution, because, um, uh, but, but when we've acted ridiculously, when we've acted wrongly, then we're rightly being persecuted. They think it, It's tempting to think that persecution means that uh, we've become Christian heroes. But even telling the truth can be wrong if we do it in the wrong way, or perhaps even a ridiculous way. The writer of the Proverbs says, a word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. And we need a lot of wisdom, don't we, about how we're going to communicate this truth, how we're going to communicate the public good that we've been talking about. We need a strategy uh, as to how to best present this Christian vision, vision in a way that really reaches and remains with the minds of our audience. Sandra's already quoted the verse from Matthew that's on the screen. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves, therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. We must take care of the good news that we've been entrusted with by God. Sometimes we only have one opportunity to share it with someone and we don't want to waste that opportunity by being careless in the way that we communicate. Communicating in the wrong way, well, it might mean that we don't have the opportunity to put right misunderstandings or preconceived ideas. So we need to remove obstacles. We need to try and move out of the way those things that pre preconceptions that people have about what the Christian message is and what we're trying to do. Jesus said to the disciples, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and they turn and tear you to pieces. Well, that was talking about the good news of the gospel. And it, and it may seem rude to talk about our audience like that, but it can be true. Preparation is needed if people are going to understand the pearls that we've brought to share with them. And when we speak on socio-political issues, then we need to be even more careful. Whatever its Christian history, Europe is now far more secular 
uh, especially in the political el elites of our nations, than it's probably been at any time. Increasingly, we find ourselves as Christians out of step with the mainstream beliefs, values, and behavioral norms of our society. But God still calls us to be actively involved in these societies, working for their transformation. We've seen that already this week. But we are a minority and we cannot impose our beliefs and values on those who do not share them. That's a fundamental tenet of religious uh, freedom, isn't it? Uh, and if Jesus' model of incarnation, if Jesus' incarnation is our model, then I don't think we should be trying to impose our views on a society that doesn't share them. He did not use, impose his teaching, but used parables. Stories that some understood and others did not. We have to persuade non-believers of the authenticity of our beliefs and our values. This will be the thing that communicates with a non-Christian secular society. And we need to understand the way people think at the moment and then try and build a connection, build a bridge Instead of confronting people with the, sh with, the sharpest form, uh, with the truth in its sharpest form, it's better to communicate a bridge first, a thought or an interlocutor that they might agree with, where we can move them on and take them forward with the truth. And it's probably best to avoid using grey areas in that area. Um, a chap from the European Evangelical Alliance said we need to think about society as a draft board. Areas that, and we should distinguish the areas of darkness in our society from the areas of light. And instead of mixing them and making it all grey, we need to work out where are the areas of light with which we can agree with and build a bridge from uh, to speak to the concerns of uh, the good news. There's some examples on the screen of some ideas where there might be areas where we can use up what our society's underlying beliefs and values are um, to point to those bright spots of, with our audience and create goodwill for a message to be received properly. Maybe it's the need of certainty, maybe it's emotional needs that our society has, a concern for the poor, the need for justice. These are all areas that, that somehow exist in our society and we can speak to them with the good news that we've been thinking about this week. And actually, that's exactly what St. Paul did as he travelled around in his earlier, earliest missionary journeys. This is what he wrote to the Corinthian church. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became win weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. Or think of the example when Paul was in Athens. He said this, For in him we live, this is Acts 17, and, have, and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Paul identified what was going on in the culture and use that to speak the truth of the good news to them. And without distorting our message, perhaps that's the way in which we should seek to communicate the truth in a way that makes people listen. The whole context of our message, what comes first and what comes next, is all important. We need to consider our audience. That's what Sandra was telling us, wasn't it? Their receptiveness, how long we'll have to speak, what medium we have access to but it still doesn't guarantee success. Later on in the same chapter of uh, Acts, Paul said this. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul, at that, Paul left the council. It won't be possible to please or convince everyone, but if we succeed in building proper connections through a relational approach, building communication bridges, well, I think we have a better chance of being considered worth talking to and, and having those opportunities to speak uh, the good news into our public squares. 
think a very important area that we need to think about is how we um, uh, make our views known and subst uh, substantiate them. Uh, it's my view that if we use Bible verses or dogmatic arguments, I think we can often lose credibility that we might have already gained in the way that we've introduced the subject. Uh, the arguments um, that we um, we make, I think, need to be credible to everyone, whether or not they have faith in, in Jesus. Professor John Warwick Montgomery wrote this some time ago now. Believers should strive to legislate those socially valuable moral teachings of Scripture, whose value can be meaningfully argued in a pluralistic society, offering arguments on scientific, social and ethical grounds, potentially meaningful to the non-Christian. I'm not sure I'd go as far as him to say that that's where we limit our strive to leg legislate. But I absolutely agree with the second half of that quote, that we need to be offering arguments which are meaningful on scientific, social and ethical grounds. That's the language of our public square. And we need to be working out how we substantiate our arguments. Not just simply saying because God says so. Because everyone will discover that God's solutions are best for all if we make good arguments for them, using the best of secular science to back them up. It means that we must do our homework. We need to find proof for our assertions. The lady who was with us yesterday, I can't remember her name now, but she mentioned a study that had been done in, uh, in Texas uh, on the, on the um, breakdown of families and the impact that that was having on them and children. Well, that's excellent research. We need to be bringing it to bear on the arguments we make for family life and in the areas of, for example, same-sex mar marriage. And we need to be careful about the language we use as well. Um, we, we forget that not everyone's reading the Bible. Uh, and non-Christians simply won't understand some of our language and may interpret it differently if we use jargon. We can speak a kind of sacred language that repels non-believers. But if we want to communicate with them effectively, we need to use the language of those we want to reach. And as we've already seen today, it's good to include stories. Our media is driven by stories, individuals. Uh, and so we need to be including uh, stories, not just theological concepts, not just policy. You don't have to read many Christian tracts till you find one that may, talks about grace, blood, saved, sin. What do these mean to the non-Christian? Uh, and we need to be equally careful when we're speaking on public issues in the public square. Uh, and the more I think the church becomes alienated from, from, from the mainstream, the longer the list of words that are just not understood by our wider society will become. I wonder if anyone's ever asked you, um, or asked this question of you, why do evangelical believers collaborate with non-evangelicals? Maybe in some of your countries it's the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church. Why do, why do evangelicals collaborate with non-evangelicals? Why do we support the initiatives of people from different backgrounds or um, persuasions? But I think actually working with others who share a particular view on a particular subject can be extremely powerful and it can give strength to our argument. The problem is that co-belligerence is often perceived as compromise um, uh, and any kind of cooperation can be viewed by some as selling out the faith. So we need to be clear about what we're doing and why we're doing it when we work with others. And I think we need to work, work hard to educate the wider church about why we work with other groups. Francis Schaeffer, um, he wrote this in the 20th century uh, about co-belligerent. In many ways, he defined the phrase co-belligerent. A co-belligerent is a person with whom I do not agree on all sorts of vital issues, but who, for whatever reasons of their own, is on the same side of the fight for justice. Sorry, is on the same side of the fight for some specific issue of public justice. In suggesting a, a rationale for co-belligerence, Schaefer made a distinction between forming alliances and engaging in co-belligerence. On the one hand, an alliance is, uh, is a kind of unity based on truth. Uh, and therefore, if we're ally allying with someone, 
then, then, then that will be probably only with Christians. But on the other hand, co-belligerents focus on a specific issue, a specific issue for a specific time, and is open to all those who share it. Later on, we're going to talk about the example of the Racial and Religious Hatred Bill in, in the UK. Well, that was co-belligerence between Christians and sectarians. Completely different views on a whole host of issues but on the particular issue, we're able to unite and work together. Co-belligerence is not another way of talking about ecumenicalism. The latter has to do with unity of believers according to the Bible. Co-belligerence is about possible cooperative um, efforts among people and beyond truths that are central to them. And so there are many areas in which we may be able to be co-belligerent with other organisations, other people of other persuasions and worldviews. Issues of religious freedom, for example, where all faiths can unite around those. On basic morality and value of life and family, well, they can be co-belligerent with Muslims, perhaps, or other faiths. On issues of world po poverty, we might want to work with uh, others. For example, the Micah Challenge, that's much broader than just Christians. Other humanitarian agencies are involved. And of course, co-belligerence has risks. But there are positives which I think in many cases will outweigh them. Any action we take has risks, and we need to weigh them up and decide what is for the better, worse, and good of promoting the good that we're talking about. I, I think in some circumstances, if we have those that have no faith at all on our side on an issue, it can make the, the argument stronger and more palatable to the society in which we're trying to speak. Uh, a few tips and thoughts on how we then approach speaking. Well, we need to understand and respect our audience. And that means we need to work hard at understanding the culture into which we're speaking to. It can be easy to just come with our point of view without thinking about how it's going to be received. And if you think about um, uh, the various evangelistic courses that are written for churches to use for non-believers, the whole premise of those courses is that they seek to start with where the person is at. And I think in our public discourse, we need to be thinking about that too. We need to be building communication bridges uh, and allowing discussion and questioning. There's a tendency in our societies that um, anything new is good. And we need to be wary of that tendency. Modern life reflects this implicit view that the old is bad and old ideas should be rejected. But I think there's a sense in which society is starting to move away from that and recover something of its tradition. And it may be that we can use that opportunity to speak uh, the good news that we've been talking about. We need to be shrewd in the way that we message and the way, and the way that we speak. We need to base our views, as I've said, on solid research, but try to present it, as, as Sandra was helping us to think about, in a way that piques interest and will grab at the attention uh, of influence and policy makers. For example, a paper on legalising burglary as an efficient means of wealth redistribution, well, that'll certainly get people's attention. I'm not suggesting it's something we necessarily want to write, but you can see how the way in which a title to a paper is given uh, will help uh, speak, uh, spark people's in in interest. In preparing for this talk, I was reading about a campaign that was run in Switzerland a few years ago. Um, there was a, a government information campaign about safer sex, and it, um, it was a, a perfect circle. But on close rank uh, examination, it was a cross-section of a condom. The Swiss Evangelical Alliance thought long and hard and carefully about how they might respond uh, and then distributed their own test po posters, again with a photo of a 
simple circle. But on closer inspection, it was um, the cross section of a wedding ring. By using a similar but yet totally different image, the message was dramatically communicated that condoms weren't the only answer to, to, to the issue that the Safer Sex campaign was trying to, uh, to address. The secular media took note of it and gave extra publicity that this, to this simple but vital message. I think we also need to think about pe being people who live consistent lives and can work for the common good. Campaigns like the MICA Challenge or uh, uh, Stop the Traffic, or the, there's a campaign in the UK at the moment called IT to try and address food injustice and um, uh, in advance of the G8 meeting that's going to happen in, in the UK in the next few weeks. I, I wonder if, if, we, if we're involved in areas where society can see the difference that we're making. Living in a way that is, um, that is consistent with what we teach, then it will make us more credible when we talk about more controversial issues. How often do we hear that Christians are just concerned about sex? Well, we need to be challenging that view by also speaking out on other issues. Caroline helps us to see the wealth of biblical material we have to address all sorts of issues in our society. And we need to be challenging this view that we're only concerned about sexual ethics. Some of the barriers to prejudice might be broken down when they realise that actually we Christians are also involved in, in, in global poverty reduction and um, good business practices other areas that aren't just the controversial areas that our media likes to tell us about. I think we also need to work hard to make sure that we show that we're about fairness and proportionality. Os Guinness gave a talk in this network three years ago in which he said Christians talk a lot about justice and often they mean just us. If we are people who are only concerned for the rights of Christians then I think politicians are unlikely to listen. And wouldn't we also be guilty of selfishness? If we focus on, on, on saying that Christians believe homosexual relationships are wrong, well then I think rules are going to slam in our faces. So we need to work hard to find communication bridges and choose the right language. We can talk about the importance of pluralism, with which everyone agrees. But this need, naturally leads on to speaking about special protection for faith in the area of this um, uh, homosexual debate, in the gay marriage debate. And we might argue for balance and pro pro proportionality. Instead of talking about religious freedom for Christians, we might want to use the language of the world and talk about freedom of conscience or thought. It means the same thing, but it chimes more. Um, with, uh, with, our, with our modern society and the language that's being used. And most importantly, we need to, we need to communicate our me messages diplomatically wherever possible. And face-to-face -face is always better because we can demonstrate an attitude of gentleness and respect. Thinking about those issues of body language and, and how we put our message across, we need to never forget that when we speak on behalf of the church, speak on behalf of Christ, well, the gospel's reputation is at stake. And Caroline helpfully reminded us yesterday, didn't she, that the only thing that will bring about social transformation ultimately is people turning to Christ. When we, when we work to defend religious liberty, well, secular politicians are always going to be far more likely to take us seriously if we're also defending the freedom of people of other faiths as well. It's the right thing to do, but it's also the pragmatic thing to do. So we need to be people that are about fairness and proportionality. I think we also need to, when we engage, stylistically present ourselves as people who are humble and have a willingness to listen. We should be marked by humility, being prepared to concede points when that's right, and a winsome approach. People react very badly to an arrogance, and I think it can damage the message that we have. Paul talks about preferring one another in love. 
and that is a good standard to bear as we seek to represent the truth of Christ. We may disagree with people, but how we disagree with people is really important. And I think there's also a role for us to be, uh, as Christians, to be celebrating what is good about society as well. Otherwise, we get we get perceived as people who just want to say no to the next development. So in the area of marriage, which is a very hot topic, obviously, um, there's been initiatives like National Marriage Week, or in the UK, a High Court judge has set up a marriage foundation, seeking to encourage and support the good things about marriage, whilst also speaking out on the other issues, which are more negative and perceived more negatively by our Secular, campaign, uh, secular hearers. Uh, and lastly, uh, a few comments on the role of the lawyer. Where are we in all of this? Well, it may be in our, it will vary depending on our particular context and situation. It may be that for some of us, um, we need to take a lead role in advocating policy change in our country. In the UK context, to give you an example, there are several organisations that are already doing that from a Christian point of view. But what they yearn for is thought through, well-developed papers analysing the legal position from a Christian point of view. If we're going to build an argument which is based on good information, then that thorough legal analysis needs to be done. And Christian lawyers are best placed to be doing that. That is a particular role for us, even if we're not involved in directly speaking in the policy arena. We can be preparing papers which, uh, which help uh, those other organisations in our own context, which are speaking in the policy arena, to be more thought through, to be more rigorous in their academic approach uh, to the challenges of the law. As we close, I wanted to tell you just a little bit more about what I think in recent times has been the high point of Christian engagement in, um, in the uh, legislative process in the, in the UK government. Um, and it was the UK's racial and religious hatred bill, uh, which happened in the 2000s. It, it was an act which, in the, on the face of it, had um, a good aim. It wanted to cut down um, racial abuse and religious hatred language being used. But the way that the bill was drawn meant that it would be perfectly possible for uh, a Christian in good faith to be talking about the exclusiveness of Christ and his claims to have been prosecuted under the Act. That was the advice we received from, um, from lawyers. And, and so uh, Christians brought together a coalition uh, in order to try and address that particular issue. And as I alluded to earlier, I think one of the great strengths of, uh, uh, of how that argument was run was that it was a very broad coalition of say, religion. So you had Christians involved who wanted to preserve the right to speak the good news about Jesus Christ in an exclusive way. But you also had secularists involved who actually wanted the ability to, comedians, who wanted the ability to ridicule and make fun of, of, of faith and Christian faith. And they united to work together for the particular end in the particular case. It was a hard battle, but in the end, it was won. Uh, and um, the government lost uh, the main uh, motion by just one vote uh, at the end of the day. And that is a testament to the prayer with which that, that battle was underpinned, I think. The one vote was the Prime Minister, who was told he didn't need to vote by the Chief Whip because, um, because uh, the vote was in the bag, so he went home, uh, which is slightly ironic. Um, but there we are. It was an example of co-religions working in a very good way, uh, completely diametrically opposed values and views, but on the particular issue wanting the same end and working together to secure that that end. And I want to finish by telling a story that I came across as I was preparing. This is a story of a chap who works for the Flemish Evangelical Alliance. Uh, and his story is testament to how careful language and prayerful and gracious behaviour can build a bridge across what many of us would have thought would be an impassable gulf. Chris Fugels, he's actually the chap who came up with that uh, draft board that I showed you earlier. Um, he's a member of the Flemish Christian Democrats and he was instrumental in protesting when his party voted in favour of gay marriage. 
uh, and it led him to create uh, uh, an organization called Sagsten, a Christian political movement which could unite those in any political party who united on Christian ethics, including on gay issues. Uh, and Chris became the, the media spokesman for a huge campaign in Belgium against gay adoption. And during that time, he was careful not to speak against homosexuality, but to focus attention on adoption and the rights of the children to have a mum and a dad. The, uh, the gay lobby were unable to accuse him of being homophobic. Uh, Chris had a political advisor who suddenly refused to continue to work with him. It turned out that this man was actively gay, uh, and, um, uh, and the advisor came, um, sorry, It turned out that he was actively gay. So Chris's response was to invite him to his house to talk about it a little bit more. Uh, and it came out that uh, the advisor accused Chris of being uh, extreme uh, anti-gay activist. Chris uh, responded by asking if he'd ever heard him, heard him say anything which was homophobic. He added that I am a Christian believer. That's why I love and respect you as a person. I don't believe you are better than I am. I am better than you are. But I know we disagree on some issues. God tells me to love my neighbour, uh, even if I don't agree with him. And I really do. If we can manage to work together, Chris said to him, we can show the world that something is possible, which most people think is impossible. We can show that love and friendship are stronger than difference of opinion. Do you want to go to that challenge? Chris tells the story that the advisor was silent for some time. He didn't expect this. He thought Chris was going to try and convince him how wrong he was. He apologised for his original reaction. The outcome was that Chris and his gay advisor continued to work together. They appeared in the media together, demonstrating that just because people disagree on gay marriage or adoption, that does not mean there has to be hatred. And several of Chris's political contacts changed their minds on gay adoption. They were now willing to listen to Chris. There was an authenticity about how he conducted the debate, a love and uh, respect, which meant that his views were then taken more seriously. The gospel's good news, and we've seen it's good news for the whole of society, and we need to communicate it. But often the world perceives it as bad news. Sometimes that's because we've communicated it badly, sometimes that's because the truth makes people feel uncomfortable. But if we're preparing well, if we're building bridges and choosing our arguments and language well, if we're understanding and respecting and loving our audience, well then I think genuine communication can be possible. It's nothing to do with compromise. We should not stay quiet or change our opinion. But we can communicate with love. And that's the love that drives us, actually. The love of Christ that wants to see societies transformed uh, in the way that God intended. But we do need to accept and appreciate that in all likelihood no one, not everyone will agree with us or even accept that we as believers should be bringing a biblical worldview uh, to the public square. And if that's the condition, well then we need to, we need to hear those words from 1 Peter. 